Richard Stanley broke onto the scene with hardware in 1990. Get ready for an encounter with some seriously heavy metal. He quickly followed that up with 1992's Dust Devil, a film that both took advantage of his South African roots and went all in on hardware's scenes of mysterious nomads wandering under a hazy desert sun. Setting the film across Namibia gives Dust Devil a rather distinct personality before you even get into the weird nitty gritty of the story. Utilising both supernatural spookies and realistic racial and border tensions to raise the stakes, <coughs> Dust Devil is a wonderful change of pace for horror cinema. Unfortunately, its reputation has been unfairly maligned for the last 30 years due to studio interference. Maybe it is because I've never been to one, so it still holds an alien feeling, but I love deserts as a location. If you have seen my recent review of Razorback, you'll know I especially love it when used in horror films. Perhaps it is just because it is relatively underused compared to the woods or haunted mansions? Or perhaps it is just because when captured correctly, deserts appear bloody majestic. A visually engrossing landscape isn't the only element connecting Dust Devil to Razorback. This film also supplies some trippy dream sequences, gritty car wrecks, nightmare jump scare fakeouts, and, most significantly of all, bird transitions. <coughs> the plot of the film, in the director approved cut at least, is as follows. A strange spirit wanders the lonely roads of Namibia, dressed in a big hat and duster. He draws in, and is drawn towards, hopeless people who have nothing left to lose, and will not be missed should they go missing. Do not be fooled, this man may seem as cool as a cucumber, but he is far from the friendly gherkin in the jar. Yes, he might start by giving you some apparently much needed coitus, but he's really here to snap your neck, to mutilate you beyond recognition, to splatter your remains over some witchcrafty business, then burn you and your house to a crisp. Christ. An antagonist that vile requires not one, but two protagonists who set out on their own parallel journeys to defeat this monster. First up is Ben, a policeman who is tasked to investigate the arson homicide, and eventually becomes entrenched in local superstitions to track the villain. Let us not beat around the bush, the man is a mess, having lost his young son in the recent conflicts, and his wife has walked out on him since then and all. With nothing to lose, Ben knows he is a viable target for the Dust Devil, but armed with an unstoppable determination, and his trusty shotgun, he embarks on his mission. At the same time, we also have Wendy, played by Chelsea Field, aka Teela, from the He-Man movie. Wonderful. She runs away from her abusive piece of shit partner without a plan. All she wants to do is just drive and drive and drive until she hits the ocean. Lost and suicidal, Wendy too is a perfect target for the Dust Devil, and it does not take long for the hitchhiking bastard to lock her down. However, he takes his time with this victim, a decision he may live or die to regret. Wait, that doesn't make sense. A decision he may live to regret. Aided by a grandiose mystical soundtrack from Simon Boswell, and a pitch-perfect narration to set the tone, Richard Stanley crafts a film seeping with atmosphere. Behind the pretty visuals are thick layers of darkness, however, and the movie is open to brief spurts of intense violence, including one of the best head explosions this side of Scanners. Familiar television actor Robert John Burke makes for a clacking bad guy. He gels right into every dust swept location seamlessly. And, unlike those repressed pansy boys Jason Voorhees, Leatherface, and Michael Myers, the Dust Devil is unafraid of speaking his mind or stripping down to his boxes to commit some murder and destruction. But yes, Dust Devil was subjected to the typical Richard Stanley curse. 
while the supernatural storyline gives the film an enchanting edge, the producers thought otherwise, and recut the material without Stanley's permission. They took it from 2 hours to a mere 87 minutes. It also removed most of Policeman Ben's involvement, effectively gutting much of the film's heart, while also neutering much of the violence. Well, unsurprisingly then, the film flopped, like a fish. What producer would do such a thing? Now, oh, them, of course. So, they're not content with just taking advantage of aspiring actresses, they have to fuck your movie too. Several versions later, Richard Stanley released his own cut, at his own financial expense, and with some strict perseverance to retrieve the negatives and control. This final cut edition, which comes in at 108 minutes, is the version you should seek out. These production troubles might pale in comparison with what Richard Stanley would go through with his remake of The Island of Dr. Barlow. <sighs> the man can't catch a break. But that is a story for another time. <laughs>